So good morning to all of you in Asia and a good afternoon to people in Australia and a evening and a very late evening to people in US. Uh, so today's the topic of the webinar is contextual approach to targeting digital advertising. And this is the second webinar on our series, uh, which we are doing with the third party uh, cookies deprecating or they being increasingly unavailable for tracking and upon the emerging approaches that people are taking or the industry lead approaches that people are taking to handle the situation. Uh, the speakers for today is, uh, we have Karan Dalal. Karan Dalal is the Senior Vice President for Business Development and Operations at media.net. He is the keynote, keynote speaker and will present the approach on the contextual advertising, which his uh, company has been championing. Uh, we would be joined by Dan Richardson, who is the head of data for Verizon Media, operates out of Australia and New Zealand. He'll be joining us on the panel. Moderating the panel would be Jonas, who is the tech lead at IAB Australia. And uh, Amit Shetty, who is from IAB Tech Lab, he will bring his point of view on the contextual guidelines that IAB has created. And uh, I am Shivendra, who is the director APAC for IAB Tech Lab. I will be moderating the entire, uh, entire session. Uh, not sharing the limelight is on the background is Shelly, the senior vice president for products. He would be helping us with question answers and running the session. Uh, so the first of the session introduction. So this is the agenda for today. Introduction to Tech Lab and Standards Portfolio. We'll run through it very quickly to just set the context. And then Karan would lead, would do his keynote presentation on contextual approach to targeting digital advertising. We'll have a panel discussion, question answers, announcements. And to straight off to our presentation on introduction to the Tech Lab. So Tech Lab is a nonprofit uh, organization. We are neutral, transparent, open source. And that's the fundamental uh, foundation on which we build our trust for the industry. We work on foundation technologies, technologies that help interoperability, bring down the friction. And we are a member driven community, uh, which is driven by all the people, uh, almost everybody of the who's who of the digital advertising industry. And we work with them closely to define the priorities of the industry. So what we do is we work on standards and some of the things that you might have heard about is open RTB, the WAST, the OMSDPA, the open measurement standard, the TCF and uh, CCP on the privacy side, on the technical side, the CIMED, uh, on standard side content taxonomy. So a lot of these things which are almost foundational stuff that runs the entire digital advertising industry. Uh, IAB Tech Lab has a very instrumental role in creating a lot of these along with everybody of the members. So it's not something that we do alone, but we work closely our, with our members to create these standards. Uh, what are standards? Uh, standards are things like uh, you know, the USB, uh, things that help interoperability, bring down the friction, what it helps is reduce development costs, improve interoperability, increase speed, fuel market innovation, mitigate risks. And uh, very quickly, what, what are our key areas or assets? We have four pillars. Uh, these are the four foundational areas where we develop technologies. Uh, identity and data privacy, uh, which is at this point of time, on the, the industry as an inflection point uh, is taking a lot of our focus at this point of time. Brand safety and ad fraud is a continuing theme which plagues the industry and we have done you know, foundational work on defining the content taxonomy, the sellers.json and on buy side to increase the transparency. Uh, ad experiences, all the things about measurement, all the technical stuff in terms of how do you deliver the ad, how do you measure the ad. And then around programmatic effectiveness, which is how the network of the ecosystem operates with transparency and builds confidence. The priorities for the next year, sorry. Yes, the priorities for the next year is uh, 
we are obviously working on addressability, which at this point of sight, I said, is the focus of the industry. Uh, the REARC project is continuing, and we are closely following all the emerging approaches that are happening at this point of industry. And at this point of time, creating our uh, guidelines that we believe the emerging solution should follow. Uh, we are working, continuing our work on technical standards for privacy. We are building a new global privacy framework, which will help which will be the backbone for all the privacy framework or the laws that are getting enacted across the industry, across the world. Uh, supply chain transparency, the work on it continues, building taxonomies on the buyer side, building the buyer JSON to bring more transparency on the buyer side. And lastly, and the least not on the measurement and attribution, where we continue our work in terms of OMSD, SDK, the brand, the brand safety and suitability solution, the vast CIMED, and podcast measurements. Next slide. So yes, we are a global organization. We are one organization. Uh, we have um, 750, almost 800 companies which are member of, uh, of our organization. Uh, Karan, who is from media.net is also the, or the board member, is on the board of uh, IAB Tech Lab and almost who's who of the tech lab or the ad tech industry is on our board. And we work closely with our board to define the priorities of the advertising technology industry. So one quick note, uh, uh, the IAB, uh, there is a IAB, the organization called IAB and IAB Tech Lab to drive the slight differentiation that while IAB, we are both sister organizations, but independent organizations, while IAB defines the, drives the market development, more on the sales and marketing side, it focuses on education, certification, research, policy, guidelines, business, and events and networking, while IAB Tech Lab on standardizations, software and tools, compliance programs, and support, obviously, education and networking events. But therefore, we focus more on the technical side and product management side, while IAB focuses more on the sales and marketing side. And together we kind of uh, serve the whole industry and are able to and try to bring you all the assets, standardizations, guidelines and research that are required for the digital advertisement industry. To bring into the focus what we have been working in on on the theme of today's presentation, Project REARC, most of you are aware of the Project REARC. And then what is the outcome that at this point of time, Project REARC has almost finished a year. And these are some of the thoughts that are emerging out of the almost one year of discussion that we have been having with the industry, that now privacy by is the default setup. Now, it is not that privacy is something that is desired. It is something mandatory. The consumers are asking for it. The governments are mandating it. And the consumer now wants to be in control. It is, uh, it is who he defines what kind of level of sharing or the level of uh, uh, access to his information he wants to give. And uh, it's, it's the platforms that are duty bound to create a consistent framework across internet, such that the same kind of choices are available to the, to the consumer. And his information is also handled in a standardized format. So uh, the consumer is now in control. Most importantly, for it to work interoperability, to work in an interoperable manner and across the industry, internet is without borders. It has to be an open standards such that everybody understands what's happening. Everybody is aware to it and everybody can contribute to it. Uh, so coming out of the project REARC, there are three scenarios which are emerging in terms of uh, how to handle the going away of third party or increasingly diminished use of third parties uh, cookies for tracking. So the first is the focus of today's webinar in terms of where there's an unlinked, which we call the situation of unlinked situation, where there is no link between the consumer data and the publisher data. And the, therefore, uh, the targeting or advertising is based on the contextual situation or the seller defines the audiences of private marketplaces. So contextual would be the focus of today's uh, webinar presentation by Karan. Obviously, the second approach is being taken by the, by the OS and the browser, the Googles and the Apples in terms of defining a sandbox approach where they are anonymizing the user 
uh, uh, they are anonymizing the user, but at the, at the browser level or at the OS level, defining cohorts to which the, uh, which the advertising can be targeted. And obviously the third approach is where we are, we are using some kind of an ID and but the ID is hashed, is anonymized, and is not available to everyone. So your identity is safe, safe, but the targeting is actually available at a very granular level. And this is what we would be talking. So on the third UID session or the is session that we'll be talking the next time, and the Google session is what we'll be talking about the browsers on the 6th of May. But coming to today's focus, contextual audiences, taxonomy. So it has to be driven by what's available on the publisher page. So that technology is how do you seller defines the taxonomy or the drug in a transparent way, shares the information uh, from the publisher's page such that targeted ads are available to him. So Karan, here is where in a very short time I would leave to you because uh, that's the real area of your expertise to lead in terms of what we are, what you are planning and what you think about contextual advertising. Sure, thank you, Shivan, and thank you, Tech Lab. Hello, everyone. Let me just start by sharing I'll my- I'll stop sharing, yeah. yeah. Great. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so thank you again, Tech Lab, for, for having me. Uh, uh, so the, the broad context of this presentation is, um, is you know, what is the state of uh, contextual advertising today? What is the, the historical, um, uh, you know, need or use cases that have sort of brought us to where we are today. Uh, and then, uh, you know, how is the, the space evolving and, and how is it that, you know, as an advertiser or as a publisher, uh, you know, I, how are you going to be able to tap into this, uh, this opportunity? Um, so just a brief outline, uh, why contextual? What was the, the uh, mode of targeting that was predominantly used in the past? What, you know, where is contextual fitting into this scenario? Uh, how does it uh, impact each uh, stakeholder in the ecosystem, you know, which is the end user, the advertiser, the publisher, how do each of them get impacted, how do each of them, um, you know, sort of use or tap into this space. Uh, what does context offer, what are the different ways of contextual targeting, uh, you know, content is not the only sort of part of uh, contextual targeting, there's a lot of things that go into it, uh, and I'll briefly touch upon all of that. Uh, what is the scope? You know, there's different mediums now uh, across uh, different uh, formats. You know, there's obviously text on the web, there's images on the web, there's audio, video, there's all, you know, a lot of different formats with OTT, et cetera, now uh, picking up steam. How can context be used in some of these different scenarios? Uh, and the last one is, is more functional, which is, you know, how do you as a publisher or an advertiser sort of tap into the uh, this space and, and what is currently, uh, you know, the mode of, uh, mode of engagement. Um, so let's start with why contextual. Um, so, you know, the, the holy grail of advertising, as you guys uh, would know, has always been, you know, right product for the right customer audience at the right time. Um, you know, historically, uh, because of the behavioral advertising being the predominant way of of targeting, uh, it was always the right product to the right customer audience, but not always was context factored into the targeting equation. Uh, you know, in some cases it did, it was, it was very primitive, uh, you know, in a lot of cases because audience served its purpose. Um, but obviously with the growing concerns around privacy and, and uh, all the changes to regulations, as well as, uh, you know, policy changes at the browser level, uh, context has started to become uh, important again. Um, so, you know, if you if you really think of uh, contextual advertising, um, 
you know, as, as, a, as a way of targeting, it was always what was used across any medium outside of uh, digital, right? So when you think of old magazines or even TV, uh, you know, contextual was the only way you could target, you know, people would advertise for vacations in a travel magazine or, uh, you know, your newspapers would have, uh, you know, financial newspaper would have more financial driven advertising. So context was always what was used. There was no such thing as audience uh, broadly, uh, but with the growth of digital and obviously all the, all the, um, you know, increased granularity that you would get and the data that you would, you were able to get, um, you know, behavioral and, you know, audience targeting started to become uh, the predominant uh, way of advertising. Um, and and what, what that did was that, you know, if you were a user that had some sort of historical data, uh, you know, the advertiser had any historical data on you, you know, because you visited the, the advertiser site or they had, you know, historical, someone had, you know, aggregated your data as a, as a user of what your interests were, they would show you an ad and that ad would broadly follow you across the web, regardless of what article you would read. Uh, and what that led to is that, you know, it didn't matter what content you wrote, uh, you know, you just needed to attract people to your website. And the more people you attracted, the, you know, the more money you made from advertising. Uh, and hence, uh, you know, context lost its, its value to some extent. Uh, and, and, you know, if you really think of the big, you know, the wall gardens, they really write no content of their own, whether you know it's Facebook or Google or Twitter, it's all sort of aggregated content and there's no real context in that sense there. So they just attracted eyeballs and they targeted uh, advertising to those, those users. Um, with, with contextual advertising, it sort of changes it a little bit and contextual advertising doesn't necessarily have to work independent of audience, uh, you know, obviously given some of the constraints that are, that are going to come in uh, over, the, over the next year or two. Um, but, but, you know, it, it could just be an additional sort of way of targeting, but it makes it more relevant if you show an ad, you know, for, for a furniture uh, on an article that is related to furnitures versus uh, just showing them the same ad, you know, regardless of the content. Um, so now coming to who is this uh, for? Um, and, and, you know, we look at all the stakeholders in the ecosystem and how it sort of impacts each one uh, from a contextual advertising standpoint, right? So if you're an end user, uh, you know, you've been pretty frustrated with retargeting. Uh, I would think, you know, there's ads following you. You're always concerned about privacy, uh, you know, who's tracking your data, et cetera, which is basically where we are, you know, today um, uh, and, and what has sort of led to all of these changes in the industry. Um, so you're, you're definitely would prefer, and there is statistics, you know, I, I was reading a recent IAS uh, report from last year where they said, you know, I think it was 76% of users, uh, see, you know, uh, sort of trusted brands more when they were advertising in context versus not. Um, so, you know, as a user, you generally trust the brand, you, you, it's more relevant for you, et cetera, and more personalized if it's, if it's targeted to the content you're reading. If you're an advertiser, uh, and, and, you know, we've got some data around this, uh, you know, as media.net, because we run a lot of performance advertising, uh, and it does drive a, uh, you know, much higher engagement and much higher ROI in a lot of cases. And again, like I said, contextual is not sort of, uh, be all and end all or, or you know, an, an, an independent mode of targeting. It can be layered onto your audience uh, targeting as well. So uh, with that additional level of targeting, it definitely impacts the advertisers um, uh, engagement rates, uh, you know, you definitely get higher intent users. If you really think of search, which is a very, very um, targeted form of advertising is purely contextual. Um, so from an, you know, an ad advertiser see, you know, see a, you know, extremely strong ROI in that form of advertising. Uh, and if you're a publisher, uh, you know, you as from an editorial standpoint has always been, uh, you know, categorizing your content, uh, seeing, you know, what sort of content users like, uh, but you've never really used context, uh, you know, to categorize uh, your content. But if you did and you, you, you sort of shared that with the advertisers, you would see uh, far better CPMs, you know, higher revenues because, you know, advertisers are now going to be able to uh, get more data and, and enrich their bid, uh, their bids, uh, bid requests with, with far more data uh, to be able to target better. Um, so now uh, jumping into what does context offer, which is sort of the meat of this presentation, right? Um, and, and we uh, at media.net have sort of 
you know, uh, distilled context into six broad types of targeting, uh, uh, category, topic, brand, safety, sentiment, events, and content types. Now, this is not necessarily um, uh, all encompassing. We could, you know, there could be, you know, substantially more things. This space is, you know, evolving constantly. Um, so this is just, you know, some of the interesting ways that context is used uh, while targeting. Uh, so coming to the first, uh, sort of method is category targeting, right? Which is something which was always used. This was, you know, uh, a little primitive uh, way of targeting back in the day is getting a lot better now. Uh, but, you know, what people just did was advertisers just knew that it was a, a finance website or a travel website and just targeted that. Uh, so if you were a travel advertiser, let's say you were a kayak and you were looking to target your advertising, you would just target some of the travel websites. Um, and, and that was sort of what was used uh, primarily. Uh, IAB has done a phenomenal job uh, over the last year and, and sort of, um, you know, standardized uh, the, the content taxonomy um, and, and, you know, they created this, you know, the 2.2 taxonomy, the 2.0 taxonomy, which is the, the 698 categories, uh, you know, and subcategories uh, and define sort of the, the, the entire internet across these categories, right? And this becomes interesting when there is a body like the IAB that standardizes it because then everybody follows a similar taxonomy and the advertisers can actually benefit from scale, uh, which is one of the constraints that you always experience when you talk about contextual targeting, right? Um, so, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, this, we've, we've tried to capture, uh, you know, three different articles using the IAB taxonomy tree. And if you see, you can actually, you know, granularly uh, categorize them as financial planning, consumer banking, and personal investing based on the, the nature of the content of the same uh, financial site um, or different financial sites in that sense. Um, so that sort of helps you uh, pass one more level of information to your advertisers to be able to differentiate between, uh, you know, a financial planning advertiser versus a consumer banking advertiser uh, and, and get them higher engagement rates. Uh, the second one and, and, and one that I consider to be uh, one of the most important uh, a lot of people, if you might be reading on the web, talk about talk about keyword targeting, right? Uh, you know, outside of category, they're just keywords on the page. Can we, uh, you know, target those specific keywords? Uh, we've gone one step further, and we actually think, you know, keywords are are, you know, not as intelligent uh, in that sense. You know, we we've sort of abstracted that and and called it uh, topics uh, because topics have context associated with it. Um, so to give you some examples and what topics, you know, what, what we consider to be topics is the first, first part of that is disambiguation, right? What is disambiguation? It, you know, if you read the word viral, uh, for example, it could mean a bunch of things, right? But taken in the right context, you would know that, you know, it is viral fever or is it, you know, a viral video that you're talking about. Uh, and, and hence that context allows you to, you know, build meaning into a specific word as opposed to using that keyword without any meaning and just targeting it blindly. So if you were an advertiser that just, you know, received viral, you wouldn't know what, what it meant. Uh, and hence, you know, you ended up, you know, targeting the wrong uh, piece of content or the wrong user uh, in that sense. Uh, the second part of it was the synonymization, right? And that that is also a very interesting uh, method of, of sort of aggregating content, right? And you might have uh, this associated with places, with people, with, um, you know, landmarks, et cetera, uh, because they're called by different words and different names. Uh, and if you can associate, you know, in this case, Meghan Markle and Duchess of Sussex were at the same, were in the article, and you could aggregate that to, to say that this is, uh, the same person, um, that sort of brings more meaning uh, to that topic as opposed to, you know, so if Meghan Markle wasn't present in an article, but you knew Duchess of, uh, the Duchess of Sussex is Meghan Markle, you could basically have that built into your, uh, your keyword or topic cloud in that sense so that you could expand your supply um, as well. And the third uh, aspect was, uh, you know, the, oh, I'm sorry. Um, just going to minimize the window here. Uh, the real time taxonomy updation, right? And this becomes very interesting when it comes to topics is because the internet is evolving, news is evolving, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on, and you need to constantly update, you know, the topics that you, uh, that you have in your in your database, right? 
um, you know, there might be, a, you know, like the capital riot example that, that we provided here, when that happened, uh, you know, you need to add that to your taxon, to your topics tree to know what that is and sort of build meaning into what that meant uh, and, and associated with, uh, with, with a certain uh, event. Uh, so all these three together, um, you know, allow you to go much further than just a dumb keyword that you're targeting and make it, you know, embellish it with, with far more data and context to be able to target more, more uh, accurately. Uh, similarly, you know, um, you, know uh, you, could, you could have uh, a lot of, you know, words on the page defined into their specific um, uh, categorization of, you know, like people, events, places, weather, uh, all of those things. So, you know, it's a company, uh, uh, you know, uh, certain brands, etc., can be categorized as companies. Uh, so when you do all of that, it allows you to sort of build uh, pools of related topics, which allows you to then again, like I said, expand supply, because what happens in contextual advertising is if you're an advertiser and you want to target finance, you might have a very limited set of supply available to you if you're only targeting finance, which wasn't the case in audience because you're just targeting, you know, the users. Uh, so now when you associate related topics to finance, you're able to now expand your supply and find more content that, that might be relevant for, uh, for you as an advertiser. Uh, the next uh, uh, topic, which is actually what was the, the most used uh, as far as contextual advertising was concerned all this while, which was brand safety. Uh, most advertisers use this uh, uh, primarily to ensure that their ads don't show up against uh, in adjacent to content that they do not like. Uh, again, the IAB Tech Lab, this was, this was pretty um, uh, non-standardized back in the day. Every advertiser had their own set of sensitive topics. Every publisher categorized their content you know, based on their own uh, way of categorization. Uh, and the IAB Tech Lab again took uh, you know the initiative and standardized this um, uh, some you know last year, uh, and they come they came up with a set of fixed set of uh, sensitive categories uh, you know that you would have to group your content into, which would allow an advertiser to to sort of figure out whether that was sensitive or not, um, and and you know brand safety was was always used uh, from a negative perspective, right? Like if you were an advertiser and you didn't want to show your ad against something that was talking about death or you know, alcohol or anything like that, you would just block off that pieces of content. But it wasn't used uh, always in a positive light. Uh, you know, and, and I'll share some examples as we move forward, but brand safety could be used to sort of target advertising or even tailor your messaging in a very different way that would allow you to get better engagement as opposed to just blocking off those topics. And, and, and you know, when I go through the example, you know, coronavirus uh, is, it was, was a big use case for this. Um, so, uh, you know, as you guys obviously all know uh, and, and may have read on the web when coronavirus was, uh, uh, you know, started and a lot of content started getting written, uh, a lot of advertisers just blanketly blocked coronavirus or COVID as a keyword and stopped advertising on any content that, is, that was associated with COVID or coronavirus. Um, you know, that led to a lot of publishers losing money. And obviously those were the articles that were getting the most amount of engagement because everybody was trying to read articles about, you know, COVID and, and, and what was going on. But there was a lot of content that was actually not brand unsafe. There was, you know, articles about what you should do at home when you, uh, you know, to be safe from coronavirus or, you know, places to go to which are safe, etc which are actually very, um, you know, regular articles that might actually get you a lot more engagement uh, overall and, and could be targeted. But because keywords without any context were used to just block coronavirus, you saw a lot of uh, drop in ad spend for, from, uh, you know, for content that, that targeted coronavirus. Um, um, and then, um, you know, moving on to sort of what I was uh, uh, actually coming back um, to, so, you know, we, we actually did a lot of um, uh, research over the last couple of months uh, to see this. And we, we actually noticed that uh, there was a bulk of content that was actually not brand unsafe uh, and had advertisers sort of tailored their advertising. And we worked with a few advertisers in this space to sort of, you know, show them this data. Um, uh, you know, that would have increased engagement for a lot of them because most users who are spending time on those pages were actually very engaged users and they were not sort of 
coming in for like a quick read. Um, and, and advertisers actually had over time, um, you know, turned around on that decision and started to uh, target a lot of that content. Uh, the next one was sentiment. Uh, you know, this is again, and something that a lot of people talk about now, uh, and there is again research to show that, you know, uh, positive sentiment um, uh, content generally results in higher engagement with ads as well. Um, but, but like I was saying, you know, with sentiment, you could also use tailoring. So for example, uh, you could, you know, when, when you're talking about COVID, which is the third example, which is smart ad alignment, uh, and you, you have a COVID article, uh, but it's not a negative article necessarily. Uh, you could actually either target uh, a positive ad about travel, but you could also target uh, an ad, you know, for Netflix because you know a lot of people are staying at home and not visiting, you know, beaches or any any sort of outside um, uh, destinations, uh, and hence it could become relevant uh, outside of the, the the regular, you know, contextual agent uh, adjacency. Um, and there's three broad sort of uh, ways that you could look at sentiment, right? The tonality of the article, is it talking, uh, you know, positively about something, negatively about something? Is, the, uh, is there an emotion uh, associated with it about a brand, for example? Is it talking negatively about a certain brand? Let's say, you know, is it, is it uh, you know, there's a new Samsung phone. Is it talking negatively about that? Is it talking positively about that? And based on that, you know, different types of advertisers could, could target against that, right? If it's talking negatively about Samsung, you could have Apple uh, targeting that piece of content. Uh, you know, versus versus Samsung. So that context makes a difference in 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 targeting as well. Um, the the next one is is events, uh, which is you know how could uh, you know things which are current be used to again target advertising, right? Uh, there is lookalike content, which is uh, again to expand your supply content that could be very similar to what the user is reading at that point in time, what is popular on the web right now, what users are most interested in. Uh, if there's uh, if, if there's a new launch of something, you could you could use that because people are extremely engaged during that time. Uh, weather, which is a big part of of targeting as well, you know, if there is rain outside, you could target certain forms of advertising, which is which is dependent on rain, which is you know stay at home, watch Netflix, cooking recipes, whatever or not it may be, um, you know, moods uh, of people, etc. And and you know, a lot of people reading uh, uh, articles about that, uh, staying at home could could then uh, you know uh, engage with those forms of advertising. Uh, and the last form is is predicted viral content as well, which is. Uh, you could use a lot of signals that you get from the from the internet to be able to anticipate if an article is going to go viral by you know tracking some of their shares uh, on social media, uh, looking at you know how many people are are visiting a specific piece of content, etc., uh, and anticipating that 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 predict that viral uh, the virality uh, and targeting advertising against that so that you could capture the upswing in in user engagement during that time. Um, and the last one is content type, which is also a very interesting sort of um, uh, way of targeting. So, you know, if you're a performance advertiser and are and is looking to target users who are sort of mid funnel or lower down the funnel, etc., uh, you want to be able to uh, find users who are reading articles about. Um, you know, product reviews, or if you're, if they're looking at building something in their house, they're looking at DIY, uh, you know, home, home advice or, or guides on specific things, et cetera. So, you know, when they're reading that they're in, in some sort of a purchase intent or they're experiencing uh, or they're in, in research mode, et cetera, where they're, they're substantially more down funnel uh, and you could target much better performance advertising uh, for those users during that time. Um, Coming to the scope of contextual targeting, I'm going to run through this a little faster because I think we're we're closer to time. Um, text is obviously a big portion of the internet, uh, and text is is predominantly uh, what is used to to figure out what is what what the what the content is about, which is you know using semantic science, you know uh, uh, look at look at the piece of content, remove everything that is irrelevant, uh, and find the most relevant topics and try and 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 find what it what it really means. 
uh, and that is done by you know crawling the article, um, uh, you know identifying topics like I was I was uh, talking about earlier, grouping topics uh, together and finding relationships between them, uh, and other such sort of uh, methods that uh, that are proprietary in nature to to various companies to figure out what what that text is is talking about. Um, you could also use real time context signals, which is, you know, uh, at, at, at any point in time, you want to be able to, you know, there's an article that is not necessarily getting a lot of views, which takes a while to, to sort of contextualize. So, you know, real time context becomes important to be able to quickly figure out what is, what is going on uh, and, and having a, a faster response time, because not, you know, if you're, if you're writing a lot of content across the web, not every article is going to get substantial views. Uh, and, and deciphering context is, is important in that case to not, to not lose out on relevant advertising. Uh, the next one is, is image-based uh, content. Uh, and again, image can, can have uh, all kinds of uh, ways to identify things within the image and, and technology is getting pretty sophisticated as far as this is concerned. You can identify locations, you can identify brands, people, products uh, within images. Uh, you can see if there is a specific object within the image uh, and, and sort of pull that out. If there's a phone, for example, or a, or a, a kitchen product, et cetera, you can remove things which may not matter, like, you know, the sky, for example, if it's if it's a, a bulk of the image, uh, or you could use the, the, the a place to figure out where it is uh, or a landmark in that sense. Um, and that is sort of used again. Uh, a lot of the internet is filled with images and that's uh, a, a big area for targeting um, and, and sort of in, in product, uh, in image placements and stuff like that, that you could also figure out with, uh, with performance advertising. Uh, and the last one, which is super relevant now, given the rise of OTT and, and audio and video uh, in general is, is text to speech. Uh, uh, so speech to text uh, as well and, and transcription technology in that sense, you know, uh, understanding what the content is about uh, and then contextualizing that content uh, using all the metadata that is provided within the content uh, as well uh, or categories of those, you know, like a podcast or something like that. Um, also, you know, a lot of podcast uh, content is available with, you know, has corresponding reviews on the internet, you could use that to build context. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff available even on the audio video front where where context is a little uh, harder um, to sort of figure out. And the last one was modes of integration, which is you know more the functional part of it. Uh, and there's a few different things in in the works right now with, with various companies, uh, uh, but you know it is fast evolving. Um, one is where you could just sort of enrich the bid request with contextual data to buyers who, and then buyers would consume it. Uh, a lot of standardization, uh, you know, plays a big role here so that uh, across publishers, you have standard uh, categorization done by, you know, third parties, by people like IAB with standards, et cetera. Uh, and then you could, you could share that information with buyers who could then consume it uh, and target against that. Uh, you could do private marketplace deals where you could create, you know, specific types of segments based on context uh, where, you know, where there's no cookies, you could use just pure context where there's a cookie, you could, you know, enrich that cookie with, with more context, like I was describing earlier. Uh, you have custom APIs uh, where a lot of brand advertisers consume post facto contextual data and see how their, their advertising was before, uh, performed, they increase efficiency where they could increase their bids on, on uh, articles which have matched their audience but have a contextual relevance versus not. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different sort of methods that people advertisers are using and publishers are definitely getting together to to try and standardize this across them so that uh, you know it makes it more easily usable and scalable for an advertiser uh, so i think that sort of wraps up the presentation thank you everyone uh, and hope to engage with you guys during the panel discussion thank you so much karan that was fantastic incredibly detailed there's a lot of high quality information in there for the attendees. You will receive a copy of this presentation. A recording of this video will also be made available uh, to all of you. Don't worry. So now we're gonna be moving into the panelists um, and you will of course have the op opportunity to submit questions into the um, Q&A functionality there that you see at the bottom of your screens. Please feel free to um, throw, throw in the questions. I'll try and weave them into the thread of the conversation as we go along. Uh, but that might be tricky, but I'll def we'll definitely leave some time to the end. Don't, don't worry. Um, so I, we have four um, 
respected members of the industry here to, to help us out. We've made it a little more representative too by involving um, the, uh, the product need in this area, Amit Shetty, as well as Karan, and also bringing in Dan Richardson here in sunny Australia, who works for Verizon Media. Um, now, to get us going, Amit, um, Karan has mentioned there the, the taxonomies, and it's sometimes an area of, of real hard work, not just in terms of the creation, but the maintenance um, taxonomies for IB Tech Lab. It feel, sometimes I feel like it doesn't get the, rec the recognition, recognition it deserves across the, the audiences, I mean, products, as well as um, content. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, the taxonomies that IB Tech Lab look after and how critical they are in underpinning all things contextual? Sure, thank you, JJ. Uh, and uh, I should just, just in terms of uh, introducing myself, I'm Amit Shetty uh, and I lead the programmatic uh, uh, efforts at the Tech Lab, including brand safety and uh, 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 anti-fraud efforts as well. And, and I should say, uh, Karan did a great job of uh, articulating a lot of the work that uh, we've done uh, uh, in, in applying the, the taxonomy uh, 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 as well. So uh, definitely thank you for that. Uh, just, just to kind of give a broader picture about what we, uh, uh, the way we look at uh, the taxonomies, uh, it, there are three taxonomies that, uh, uh, that we have produced at the Tech Lab so far. Um, and uh, they're the audience taxonomy, the ad product taxonomy, and the content taxonomy. And the common theme across all of these, uh, I would say, are uh, number one is transparency, just making sure that uh, 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 trying try to bring about uh, transparency in communication across all these uh, three uh, areas. Uh, but probably the bigger part of it is the common language, right? So providing that common language that everyone can use that uh, 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 rather than everyone describing things in a different way, you now have a, a, when, when somebody says something uh, about uh, either, an, either the audience or the content, it's, uh, it should be clear to everyone what that uh, means. And, and, and so that's the purpose of uh, the taxonomies. Uh, the audience taxonomy, like the term says, uh, is about uh, describing the audiences, like the people uh, and uh, the various categories that they can belong to. Uh, uh, the ad product taxonomy is uh, uh, tied to the ads themselves, right? So, how do you? Uh, what kind of an ad is this? What what uh, uh, is this an automobile ad? Is this a uh, 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 you know a, 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 an ad for uh, working work, for workouts? Things like that. So that's basically the idea behind the ad product taxonomy. Uh, but the content taxonomy, which is the thing that we've spent a lot of time on, and probably the most interesting for this group as well, is about all about uh, describing the content itself. Uh, uh, and this is very key uh, uh, um, uh, these days, of course, uh, 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 because you really want to talk about the content without necessarily getting into the uh, uh, into the into talking about the people, the the uh, audience itself. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think current is uh, current has covered both the key areas, uh, the purpose of the content taxonomy as well, right? So the, the first part is the contextual targeting, and the second is also for brand safety. Uh, 2.2, which was released uh, uh, last year, was driven a lot by uh, the brand safety conversations last year, where there were a lot of problems around content being blocked by because of keywords and all that, and the idea of sentiment analysis and suitability came into play. So when we talk about uh, uh, the way we look at brand safety in, in this context is really not in terms of, not necessarily in terms of blocking things, but also in terms of being a little more nuanced about uh, describing content, right? So basically uh, uh, we have the concept of uh, 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 the suitability, which is uh, ref which should reflect the, the tolerance levels of the agencies as they buy, uh, of, the, of the brands as they buy uh, uh, inventory. Uh, just because something is, just as a random example, uh, uh, something is about, uh, I don't know, arms and ammunition, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. It is ba really bad if it is uh, is trying to sell illegal uh, arms and ammunition, but it may not mm -hmm. be as bad when it is talking about maybe the news article or an educational article and so on. So that's the key part uh, over there. So anyway, yeah. that's, that's kind of a, a broad uh, view of uh, uh, the taxonomies and what we're working on. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's it. That's, uh, that's, that's it. absolutely right. And hence the requirement of that semantic depth that Karama's talking about so you truly understand the, the content on it. And it's great advice for buyers and agencies to just be aware of their appetite for risk in terms of what they're prepared to, what they're prepared to expose um, their brand to. So Karan, to come back to you and after that wonderful presentation, thank you, Amit. Um, you, you did mention the distinction between the, dif uh, uh, the different um, aspects of targeting, such as behavioral and contextual, but uh, I think often the two kind of do get meshed into one another. Can you just, can you just, um, 
re-clarify or, or give us some real distinctions between the differences between behavioral and contextual? Sure. Um, so I think, uh, uh, you know, behavioral advertising is, uh, and, and again, this, this generally applies mostly just to, to the web, uh, you know, where, where you have cookies and, and some sort of an identifier to identify a user. Um, so behavioral advertising is, is just factors in uh, the historical context that you have of the user, right? If the user has visited your website, uh, you know, as an advertiser, let's say you're, you're Amazon and the user has been on your site, you know uh, what the users look for, uh, what type of uh, uh, content across the web that the users browse, uh, browsing on, on an ongoing basis and what their interests are. Uh, based on that, you sort of build some sort of data on that user uh, and you're targeting that specific user, regardless of where that user is on the web. Um, versus context, which is uh, you're targeting the user in that mode uh, of, of him or her reading a piece of content. Uh, so you're not necessarily targeting just the user, you're, you're targeting the time that the user is on, uh, on a specific piece of content. Uh, so I, I would say that's broadly the distinction. And, and yes, the, you know, they have been used together in the past, uh, but in a very, very, like I was saying, in a very primitive way where context didn't really factor uh, into the targeting as much as it should have. Uh, and now with, with some of the changes coming in, I, I think it's going to become more relevant uh, across both. Yeah, yeah, it does feel like a renaissance for contextual, doesn't it? Um, so Dan, coming to you now, and, and um, Karan did touch upon and the utilizing semantics and the depth. It's not necessarily just about brand safety or a defensive um, approach, you know, you, you can run a lot of positive targeting attributes utilizing contextual signals. Can you um, provide us some insights or examples of, of, of this that you utilize at Verizon? Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I think it's it's hard to ignore, um, you know, what you're talking about in your um, presentation, um, uh, Karan, and, 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 you know, there's 698 categories for contextual, but I think uh, for the last few years, we've all been focused on using about two dozen of them. Uh, for brand safety sensitive categories, uh, which is, is, you know, obviously uh, important. I think, you know, if we look at our research, um, one in three brands has, has, has really been negatively impacted um, by offensive content or low quality content, which, which you do tend to get on user generated um, properties there. But there's also a huge opportunity. Um, in your presentation, you also mentioned news uh, before and the responsibility that particularly publishers have have had to produce uh, content, uh, particularly around uh, the last you know, year or two, um, coronavirus most recently, that is, is valid and, and, and premium. The, what, we, what we understand is that, you know, 77% of brands that we speak to when we're talking about this sort of stuff feel that, you know, there's actually no negative impact or negative sentiment to their brand by appearing next to, to news like that. And, you know, consumers really do expect uh, to see uh, ads which are relevant uh, to the content there. What we've also focused on a lot is, uh, you know, basically uh, contextual signals alone. So looking at the URL of a page for web or the app category uh, to form these types of things in the past. But, you know, what we also know is that, you know, when we are trying to look at people's interests or, or infer their, uh, their demo, for example, age and gender, Things such as, as as context, so that the URL or the app category, they're, they're really we find to be less than fifty percent of the contributor uh, to accuracy. Uh, so accuracy in, in, in delivering that person uh, an ad um, based on you know the, the context or or starting to infer new things like their their age and gender. Um, this is where uh, there's some really exciting stuff happening to go uh, to I guess add on the standard taxonomy to add on to a custom keyword uh, with, with new areas as well. Uh, and that's where if you're a publisher, there's, there's a huge advantage to be able to pull in other signals as well. And I think you mentioned some of them in, in your presentation being, uh, you know, things such as location, uh, weather. Um, so if you're a publisher, you really have access to that. If you're a demand side platform or, or SSP, or if you bring those together like we do at Verizon, then, then you can really build on those contextual signals. And there's so much that can be done uh, done there um, to, to build on this and get away from that focus on just brand safety, I think. 
Yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how things um, evolve, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. Now, Amit, the, the recent recent release of uh, the Project Rio, which in four sets of standards, and specifications come out, and one of which was um, in relation to taxonomies and, and nomenclature. So, if you and, and it was mentioned in Karan's um, presentation there around it playing a role in as anonymized audiences as, as third parties regress. Can you talk to us a little bit more about, about that, how, how that's evolving as a, as a solution moving forwards? Um, yeah, let, let me give a shot to that. Uh, so the, uh, I think the key part there is with, with the content taxonomy is in terms of being able to talk about uh, the content itself. Uh, you know, we're talking about the context uh, uh, of the content, right? So we're talking about describing the content and uh, and using the uh, context of the content for being able, for, for 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 sending out uh, uh, relevant ads. And the key part of there is that you're not really trying to uh, follow a, a particular user uh, across uh, uh, the things that they're doing, but you're more about the, looking at the content that uh, uh, you're sending your ad in, in the context of the content itself. Uh, and the key and the, uh, uh, the 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 beauty of that is that you you the you have the advantage of not you do have to worry about uh, privacy concerns in certain areas. Uh, in fact, uh, 2.1 version of the content taxonomy was uh, uh, really focused on, uh, I think it's called special category data, uh, which is some sens sensitive areas, sensitive categories, which people have to pay a lot more attention to just to make sure that they that uh, uh, unintentionally uh, might be providing some uh, uh, pri uh, you know, uh, privacy, uh, pri private data uh, about the users based on the kind of things that they're browsing, uh, but uh, uh, but but other than that, it really is about uh, uh, you know focusing on the content itself. And and the uh, two point x uh, version of the content taxonomy has uh, uh, gotten a lot richer. Current kind of uh, uh, went over that a little bit uh, uh, when he was talking too. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little and share my screen uh, uh, for one slide uh, uh, and uh, uh, talk and kind of talk about the uh, the richness of the content taxonomy over there right can you see my screen right now yep yeah so uh, the uh, uh, in addition to just talking about the aboutness of the topic like things like uh, automobile in this particular example uh, uh, we also added the uh, additional vectors additional attributes uh, like language, form factor, uh, media type, and, and things of that, where uh, uh, now you can look at it as, okay, this is an automobile uh, related to automotive, uh, but is, a, is an editorial piece of content. It's a review or a news article. Uh, and uh, uh, it also talk about the content source, right? This is, this is professionally produced versus user generated, things like that. So uh, uh, there's a lot more richness uh, uh, that uh, in the about the metadata that you can describe. And the way you describe it is very simple, right? Just an array of uh, uh, the IDs of that of that category, and uh, and keep it as simple as that. And this basically allows you to uh, really uh, uh, understand that content in a in a much more richer uh, way, and uh, uh, and be able to target uh, based off that. So so I mean, the, uh, uh, and I don't mean to discount the idea of uh, uh, knowing your users uh, a lot more, and uh, you know, uh, there's always going to be a place for that as well. But uh, uh, we do believe that that the contextual targeting is going to get a lot more important because of privacy concerns. Yeah, 100% privacy safe, so it, it's not going to go away. But a very good uh, yeah, point there about the special category. And that came out, that's a sort of European, thank you, we've got the pain of Europe that we can uh, we can, we can uh, leverage um, from, from all things GDPR. Um, now, Karan, um, we've probably got a mix of buyers and sellers um, on this um, webinar. What, what's a good starting point in terms of reviewing the capabilities for either buyers or sellers? Um, where would you advise they just start in terms of research and getting their hands dirty with these, these types of capabilities? Uh, sure, th thanks, uh, John. So um, I'd say the first the first step in, in that would be to uh, sort of align with some sort of a standard. Because uh, without without adhering to some standard, you know, you're not going to be able to transact. So, you know, if a publisher, for example, is trying to create their own taxonomy or their own ways of categorization, I mean, if they're creating a private marketplace, uh, they could use that uh, in some ways. But you obviously need to be a you know pretty large publisher to be able to to build your own proprietary taxonomy for that. 
so I think, you know, the IAB Tech Lab uh, taxonomy is definitely a great starting point. Uh, and then, you know, using, you know, there's a bunch of third party companies that can, you know, add to some of those uh, taxonomy uh, categorization, uh, you know, some of the stuff that I was, I was talking about around sentiment or, um, you know, uh, content type uh, 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 and, and topics, et cetera. Uh, so that, that could all sort of combine together. Um, uh, and then, you know, on the advertiser side, they need to be able to start consuming this, right? So even from an advertiser and agency standpoint or a DSP standpoint, uh, they need to sort of, again, align to a certain framework or a certain standard. So I think that's another uh, aspect because, you know, again, if you're in the bid request receiving a whole bunch of different topics that you don't know what to do with, you know, it's going to be useless information. Um, so I think the first step in, in all of this is uh, trying to basically adhere to some standard. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, work being done in this space uh, already. Obviously, the Googles, um, uh, their, their, their flock is going to have its own set of uh, categorization uh, as well. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that would be the first step once that is done. Uh, and then, you know, someone, whoever's adhering to that, and then it's more about accuracy, uh, and, and what additional stuff you can provide with that. And that could basically result in, in both sides, you know, transacting. Uh, but overall, I think, you know, them, both publishers and advertisers trying to come up with some sort of a standard way, uh, to categorize content is, is, would be a good starting point. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. And. Look, I can only say um, objectively from my personal experience going back a fair bit, I must admit that testing out various vendors solutions, there was the, comparing two at one point, one was very detailed as an actual standalone piece of kit. It was quite incredible, the depth and level of detail it, it went to, but another vendor is just more usable. It was just operationally more efficient and effective for our teams, for the, for the products that we wanted to run, I guess. So it, it's really worth sort of looking around and teaching yourself through, um, through testing out um, various options, but that's that's great advice, Karan. Now, Dan, we're gonna give you a bit of a crystal ball here, um, chat, just uh, before we head into the Q and A's, we've got some questions coming through, which is where, where do you see things evolving for contextual? Because there's a number of different companies talking about the evolution of it, whilst it's not a new new product per se, and Karan's hinted at a lot of the ways that it's things are being integrated. There's a lot of talk about machine learning, adding to it, et cetera. Well, how do you see things evolving over the next 12 to 18 months? Well, I think if we look at what's happening, um, be it to the browsers or, or operating systems or regulation, you know, identity uh, really is in jeopardy. Now, if you're, a, um, if you're a marketer or a brand who is kind of doing nothing uh, right now about those types of things, you, you're likely to see, and we believe up to 75% of ad opportunities by next year with without an identity attached. Now, contextual, we believe, or I believe is, is a really significant uh, contributor and then has a, a large role to play. Um, but, you know, as we said before, it really has to go beyond just uh, content and contextual categorization um, to incorporating real-time signals um, and, you know, looking at how we can combine them uh, with uh, known audiences or seed audiences. And they, they can be from a third party, but if you're, uh, a company which has your own uh, logged in first party uh, members as well, you can really understand you know, who they are, what they're doing, what their age and gender is, for example, and combine that with both contextual signals and also uh, other real-time signals as well, device type, location, weather. Um, the way we're looking at that is bringing that together, as you said before, JJ, with, with machine learning to, to use those first party seed audiences to help train the other signals as well. So, um, so context and, and, and real-time signals. And the end result is you know, being able to, to operate in an ecosystem which could very well be ideal-less for many players. Um, so it's, it's really important to bring those types of things together if you're looking at a solution over the next few years and, and get beyond just context, but also to validate how effective it is as well. Um, so you, you want to make sure that if you're doing um, you know, demo that you're looking at how accurate that is. So um, from our perspective, we're, we're working with Nielsen to validate the, the accuracy of that. Um, but then moving on from that, we'll, you'll see a growth in, um, in next gen audiences. So context is part of that, but there's other signals as well. Next gen audiences looking into things like interests, uh, income, lookalikes and predictive as well. So 
there's going to be a lot of investment in this area because it's such a valuable building block alongside attribution and matching based on things like email addresses. Thank you very much. Um, now, we're going to, we kind of look to answer one of the questions here from the, the attendees, but we're going to do something slightly experimental, which is to ask Bosco Lan, who's asked, who's asked the question, um, and we're going to try and get in, involved in this group. I hope you, uh, you're all right with that, Bosco. We've, uh, hey, Bosco. <laughs> hey, hi, we, ex hey. we expect that you are, but um, you, you asked the question, how would you expect downstream partners, i.e. DSPs, SSPs, to recognise the unique publis publisher signals? Can you just clarify a little bit more in terms of what you mean by that question, and we'll, um, and we'll, we'll attempt to answer it? Yes, uh, sure. So um, uh, thanks uh, for the panelists uh, and Karan for the great presentation. Um, and Karan has actually mentioned um, as a publisher, uh, you create uh, some contextual or, or different kinds of signals uh, or uh, contextual data so that you can pass along for the bitstream uh, partners so that they can recognize within a big request. Uh, I just want to uh, understand if there's a standardization either from the IB tech lab or uh, from uh, DSP SSPs like Verizon would have this uh, recognition of uh, such uh, segments uh, defined by the publishers. Thank you. If I can, oh, well, uh, if I can give a first shot at, uh, at, at an answer, I think the uh, um, uh, and the trick behind and the intent of the taxonomy is to kind of address that kind of a problem right so to have that common language that everybody understands if you go beyond uh, the 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 that well defined set of categories and you can go beyond that as well you can you can always add your own set of define your own set of categories the challenge is going to be um, will the other side understand it or not and so if you have a custom set of categories it basically will mean that you'll have to have a proprietary uh, 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 agreement, basically, uh, with the other side to make sure that they understand it, uh, and that's true of pretty much any uh, of our standards, right? So you have the standard which is defining the exact set of uh, uh, things that uh, uh, that are part of that standard, and then you have then you can have your extensions and uh, custom uh, things which uh, only the people who have implemented them will know about. I can chip in. I think that there's room for both, or as they say in um, Old El Paso, porque no los dos. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know, really, we need to standardise as a, as an industry, and um, that I mean, that's what buyers um, would like. Um, we have 350 categories for standard contextual, but obviously there's the IAB taxonomy as well. Um, but by the same token, we don't want, and this is from a publisher perspective as well. You know, we don't want everyone just having this going to market with the same taxonomy either so that there is room for bespoke and I think you'll see that happening through um, through programmatic deals that we're, we're putting into you know other um, uh, other DSPs as well yeah I mean providing consistency and those predetermined um, attributes is one thing but you always need to be able to layer on the customization as long as there's a understanding of, of what that looks like so right. And and just to add to that uh, the probably a, a piece of advice I would add on there would be to in, make sure that you have a fallback uh, uh, tech lab, uh, uh, you know, taxonomy uh, category also, right? So the the, the cool thing about the tax on the uh, about the categories is that you can have multiple categories associated with a piece of content. So right, so it, it is not just a one uh, uh, a value field. It's you can have an array of values. So uh, uh, in case even if somebody doesn't recognize one of the other values, they can always fall back on the ones that do recognize and go with that. Just, just sorry, uh, a quick thing there is, um, you know, I, I think a lot of this is going to be driven by by whatever the advertiser outcomes are, right? So when an advertiser is, is trying to target against a piece of content, there might be five different taxonomies, there might be five different data context data providers. Uh, but you're going to sort of figure out by trying all five, which, which as you know, as Jonas was suggesting, 
uh, which one is sort of giving you the best outcomes? Are you, you know, you're, tra you're tracking towards some sort of an ROI, whether there's engagement on your site or a purchase or, or anything like that. Uh, you're going to see what is what is sort of helping you in your bid request. And some of it can be through standardization in an open exchange. Some of it is going to be through some sort of a private marketplace deal uh, that is going to be far more custom. Uh, and then, you know, over time, I think that will evolve to something a little more uh, consistent, uh, you know, which which would be utilized on in, on the open exchange. You know, there'd be one provider or two providers that might sort of surface to to becoming a more, you know, like back in the day, Grapeshot was one of those companies that that became pretty, uh, you know, uh, uh, pervasive as far as you know how how agencies and advertisers uh, bought context and and brand safety data. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of points to that. One is like uh, if you find uh, things that uh, our taxonomy doesn't cover today, uh, for whatever reason, it could be like a regional or a language reason or a cultural reason. Uh, we do invite you to join in and, and present what you want to get added and, and then uh, we can present it to the working groups and have that added uh, as part of the taxonomy. It's a, it's a living standard. It's not a one time standard. So like we just released 2.2, we're getting ready a 3.0 version uh, pretty soon. Um, so uh, it's an open and, and, and living standard. So we invite you to kind of uh, send us your inputs if you think something else needs to be added to it. That's a very good point. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the current updates that we're working on uh, on the video uh, uh, front were driven by the uh, by by a number of the video uh, CTV uh, folks saying that hey the taxonomy doesn't meet the needs uh, uh, of of that audience so so yes that, that uh, I think that's uh, good and second point I wanted to make was like uh, the importance of content taxonomy uh, besides just the contextual targeting is uh, for brand safety uh, brands are getting much more smarter and smarter and they're deploying more smart tools. Uh, to assess brand suitability about uh, the content that their uh, ads are being placed in. Uh, so it really makes sense for publishers to uh, deploy a content taxonomy and, and understand their own, um, the, the content better, uh, just for the brand safety purposes. Thank you very much. Well, I hope that uh, that answered the question for you, Bosco. I mean, the, you, you look at the, the technology involved, and obviously different languages, different dialects, as Shayla mentioned there, is, is always a, a challenge. But um, but for now, thank you so much for the panellists. And it's, uh, it's back to you, Shivendra. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yes, a quick word of thanks to everyone, Karan, uh, 12, 1 o'clock in the night. Uh, Dan uh, for chipping in. Dan Verizon Media is also on the board of IAB Tech Lab. Uh, Amit always adding on to with his uh, with his wisdom and obviously the co-writer of the taxonomy. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope it has been meaningful to you. And very quickly, please do look out for our next sessions on 22nd of May and on 6th of April. Uh, 22nd of May, we will deal with the with the entire user-enabled IDs. And on six, we are inviting Trade Desk and uh, other, other, other companies to join the panel uh, to talk about the user enabled IDs. And on 6th of June, 6th of May, we'll talk about the cohorts that the flock approach and the fledges approach that Google is building on. Uh, Karan, again, thanks again. Uh, no words can capture all, all what we have done. A very good session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, JJ. Thank you. Thank you.